Morning, everybody. You're at the deploying OEE cluster session. Welcome. Uh, I'm Lance Spielman. If you guys uh, don't know me, I recognize a lot of faces here. So, welcome, uh, welcome to the new faces and all the returning ones. We've got uh, a motley crew for you today to talk about uh, deploying clusters, uh, OEE clusters. So. Um, I'm just going to introduce folks and then let you know people that actually know what the hell they're talking about actually uh, tell you what they know. Um, but I just want to give a little brief introduction. Um, first of all, you know, I was thinking about why you know why would you come to this presentation? Um, the the title of the presentation maybe didn't quite make it in uh, the way we intended. Um, presentation's mostly about automating deployment of OAE clusters. And so if you have specific questions about how do you configure a cluster or this, that, and the other, we'll probably save that for the end for the Q&A session. Uh, mostly we're going to be talking about uh, all the technologies that we use to roll out uh, and clone OEE clusters uh, in our deployments at RSmart. Um, so the other question is, you know, why, why would you be interested in that? Uh, for, you know, a lot of institutions, you may only have one implementation. And if you have a good way to clone that into your staging or test environments uh, through some other mechanism, you know maybe maybe the automation isn't isn't worth uh, the effort. Uh, in our case, you know we've got to spin up many of these things for many different customers, and so our ability to you know turn them into cookie cutters that have a high degree of consistency across implementation, and then to maintain those things over time uh, is important for us. And uh, you might find. Uh, maybe not only for OAE, but for other things that you're maintaining at your institution, you might find this technology actually pretty useful. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Duffy to talk about uh, the clustered architecture a little bit. Hey, good morning, folks. So just to, uh, oops, my slides have changed a little. Uh, just to start things off, I wanted to make sure there's a baseline so that people understand what it is we're clustering. I mean, we know it's OAE, but what is it under the hood that we're actually trying to make scale? Um, so I've, I've created a diagram that uh, just kind of breaks down the parts of OAE as you'd probably encounter it in a standard implementation. And, you know, at the very top, there's an Apache server, and that's your, your, your HTTP front end that's, you know, the, the the piece that actually hosts your web server and, and the place that your browser comes knocking. Um, that's not too interesting. It just handles the basic protocol and you know can do some uh, you know helpful things like manage SSL um, and do load balancing, which will become important as we scale. The really interesting part, and I'm missing. Wow, this has changed a lot. Uh, <laughs> so this middle part with the bundles and the Jackrabbit, that should all be within that Felix box. That is. That is the OSGI container. That is the, the heart and soul of OAE. That's where all the logic really happens. Um, you see these things going horizontally across that are all labeled bundles. All of the functionality that happens in OAE are little bundles that are deployed in, in this OSGI container uh, that are backed by a JCR implementation, a, a Java content repository. Uh, which can hold static content and configuration, things like HTML files, uh, static JSON config, stuff like that. So anything that OAE does is implemented as a bit of Java code deployed in these bundles um, that you know either respond as a servlet to one of the HTTP requests or exist as a service on the back end to perform work for an HTTP request. So that middle part, that Felix bundle, that is the application. It relies on a bunch of sort of uh, ancillary services. Well, one, one of them, the, the biggest, well, I won't say the biggest. One, one of them is the sparse content map, which was, uh, I don't know when it started development, but uh, it was devised as a replacement for Jackrabbit for all of the user-created content uh, and for authorizables uh, for users and groups and for the permission system. So that is a NoSQL solution. It's built on top of either a NoSQL engine or a SQL database. Um, so that is you know, the, the major content store. 
Um, below that, you'll see a file system which actually uh, handles the, the binary objects, you know, large files, PDFs, uh, doc files, whatever might have been uploaded by uh, your users. And then along the bottom, you'll see that there is a solar search engine. This is sort of like the second half of the NoSQL uh, sparse content map. Uh, sparse content is really good at scaling and, and managing key value stores and in our implementation, managing a hierarchical set of data. Um, but in moving to a NoSQL solution from a traditional RDBMS that uses SQL, you lose some things, particularly you know the ability to do you know, uh, you know S SQL searches or joins or, or whatnot. The Solar Search Engine brings some of that functionality back by allowing us to index the things that are in sparse content uh, and allows us to to do queries uh, to actually find the documents and, and content that we want. And then finally, there's a preview processor, uh, which is a piece of OAE which grabs new content that has been uploaded, generates a small set of thumbnails for that content, and allows those thumbnails to be displayed instead of the larger document or some generic GIF image or, or anything like that. So that's, that's basically what we're talking about. And, and you can deploy everything that's on this screen on, on a single server. Um, and, you know, you can support, you know, I, I don't know how many people on a single server, but, you know, a few hundred people, you know, I don't know. Ten? Okay, Eric says ten. And we, we want to support way more than ten people, so, yeah, we want to support way more than, than ten people or your extended family, as Kyle is suggesting. So uh, we want to uh, talk about how you cluster this to scale. So, um, you know, the, the, the first point where we might cluster this is, you, you'll see in the center of the diagram, I have multiple OSGI containers. So. We can now stand up multiple app servers. Each are hosting the, the main logic of uh, OAE. And we can use Apache as a load balancer to distribute traffic between them. So all of the logic that responds to the calls from the user experience, or the UI, can be spread across multiple servers. And your requests, when they hit Apache, can be spread across and you know, whatever sort of load balancing scheme you want to use. So that's one way of scaling. Um, Another way of scaling is to set up the storage engine on the back end of the sparse content map to scale across machines. Like, uh, you know, we, we've been using Postgres um, to actually underlie sparse content map. So, you know, we do things like we'll have a master with multiple slaves to, uh, to scale read performance. Um, additionally, Solar Search uh, can be set up in a master and slave. Uh, fashion so that again you can in improve read performance. Uh, the preview processor can be offloaded onto another machine. And then finally, since you've now moved, uh, moved on to multiple machines, you can no longer rely on a single, a single file system. You now need something like an NFS server to, to share the files across all of the machines that need the content. So this is, this is what we're talking about when we're talking about clustering OAE. We're talking about moving from that world where everything lives local to one machine and all the processes can talk to each other to spreading out, having multiple app servers to host the OSGI container, having multiple servers to host the database, having multiple servers to, to support solar, and then offloading some of the other processes. Okay. So where, did, where does that put us in terms of the actual technical work? Oh, so this is, this is basically sort of a minimal configuration we kind of work with for, for clustering. And it's, it's eight machines. It's, it's one Apache HTTPD server to serve as the load balancer, two app servers, uh, one Postgres server, one Solar server, one NFS server, and one preview processor. Um, we haven't as yet found the need to, to be talking about having multiple Apache servers. We could grow out the app servers, the Postgres servers, and the solar servers to, to increase uh, scale, although at this point we haven't got the numbers to know when we need to increase each. We're still working on that research. Um, but as far as the NFS server and the preview processor, those are unlikely to need a lot more scale in the near term. So what does this mean? What do we have to worry about when we start moving from a single server to a clustered environment, 
particularly when we've got multiple customers that we're supporting and need to be able to stand up this minimal set of eight servers for each customer and then stand up a set of testing servers for each customer or a staging service for each customer. Every time we do this, we have to stand up eight more machines with all these moving parts talking to each other. This means that when we stand up the machines, we have to be able to uh, reliably identify the machines. What are their host names? What are their IP addresses? Do they know each other's identity? Do they know each other's IP addresses or host names? We need to have user accounts so that our operations people can get in, so that our developers can get in, so that the, you know, the database user exists and can reliably start up the database. Uh, we need to configure the messaging queue that, that works within OAE to make sure that when an event happens on one OAE server, that, that event goes to every place it's supposed to go. We need to replicate EH cache, which um, I'm not going to go too much into detail, but you know, the, the main purpose for, for this is there's a set of, uh, of uh, encryption keys on each server that are used to validate the cookies that users are coming in with so that when they bounce from one OEE application server to another, we can still recognize them as logged in. Um, there's adding app service to the load balancer. There's firewall rules, making sure that you know, all the servers can actually talk to each other, that no one else can get into those servers. Uh, there's making sure backups are running. You know, that there's just a, a whole host of things. There's thousands of little touch points where these things need to be configured to talk to each other. And then on top of it, we need to assure that that has done, been done correctly. You know, if we have one SSH port that's not open between the preview processor and, or sorry, that's a bad example, uh, between, uh, you know, one machine and another, it, it might break a process and we might not discover it until we're in production. That's a bad thing. So we need to make sure that each one of these points is accounted for and is done in a replicable way. And we can't spend hours for every, you know, uh, creation of a new cluster having someone manually go through and, and making this configuration work. So, what do we do? Oh, all right. You guys want to come yeah, sit down? These aren't our seats. So yeah, um, so it's a lot to configure. There's a lot of moving parts, and there's a lot of different kinds of things to configure. Files, services, anything that you could do on an operating system, Puppet can take care of. And I love Puppet, like, more than a friend. Like, <laughs> it's a, I'm a huge fan. If you're a sysadmin, you will start to love it. Uh, it'll make your job obscenely easy. You'll almost forget how to do it half the time. You can express things in a really nice descriptive language and know that once Puppet has run and it's run successfully, your system's done. And it's all kept in version control. So if someone adds a package and you want to understand, like, where did this thing come from? Just go into GitHub, you know, hit the blame button and call Duffy up and yell at him, you know? So, <laughs> I, <laughs> I used Puppet at my last job when I was at NYU, and we took a team. You know, when I started, it was me and like 10 Linux machines, and that was a full-time job, and I was like harried. And by the time I left, it was me, two other guys, and close to 1,000 machines. And we were like the laziest people in the world. We were like tan and fit and at the gym, you know. <laughs> so just, we just didn't have to do our jobs anymore. It was, it was pretty fantastic. So we've basically developed a set of modules, one per service, if you will, um, that go and do everything that we need to do when it comes to setting up an OAD cluster. There, there's no more manual configuration. I know that if I have an account, Puppet created it, my keys are there, the right services are running, NTP is configured, everything's going to happen and I can be comfortable knowing that the system is correct and consistent. Uh, so this is just a quick idea of what a Puppet script looks like. This is our NTP module. So uh, it comes in and says, you know, make sure NTP is installed. And the service, NTP, make sure it's run. And if it's on a Red Hat system, it's going to use check config to, you know, uh, do uh, make sure it starts at boot. This file is going to be, I mean, this comes from a parameter. So you get to pass in, like, you know, America slash New York or, you know, Phoenix, whatever. This actually just creates a link. And here's the, you know, the target was passed in. And if it ever changes, restart the NTP server because the NTP server needs to know about that. So you can define all of these resources and the relationships between them and have a consistent system. And this is just how you associate it with a single node, some node. Just attach it to the NTP class. And you can start creating profiles. You can start inheriting you know, these profiles and getting more and more complex configurations with a really nice descriptive language. 
and there's no more of those scripts that are like, step one, yum, upgrade this. Step two, put this file in place. Copy and paste your key over here. It's just, that sucks. I hate it. <laughs> and, and so we're running, you know, three full-size clusters now. And, you know, we don't have to configure the new ones. We don't have to think about anything. You just, okay, that's the app server. Boom, pop it. Let it go. It's going to install an app server. And, and if you want to reinstall the app server, we literally just delete the entire directory where the app server lives and run Puppet again. And it gets what it needs to do, and it puts everything in place, and the permissions are correct on files. So, I mean, I can talk about Puppet all day long. It really is an amazing tool. If, if you've ever done any system administration at any kind of, you know, more than five or ten machines, you're going to want to use some kind of configuration language like this. There are competitors, Chef, CF Engine, but... They don't have as a robust community around them right now and such a clean, Ruby-like syntax. Um, you can do things like create a template of your config file and then render it against known facts on the machine. So you can get you know, the current kernel version, what operating system am I running? All these things are available to Puppet in a nice, normalized fashion. You just type factor on your machine and you will see all these awesome, like beautifully formatted little facts about you know, where you are. <laughs> so uh, it kind of takes a lot of the guesswork out of the game and allows us to run a lot of machines with very, very little manual intervention pretty much ever. So, um, so you know, actually one of the things that comes to mind, Eric, is um, if you have the ability to spin up virtual machines, you know, that works really well with this kind of technology and sort of, you know, those things go hand in hand. You know, one of the things this is, has allowed us to do is basically create throwaway clusters. So, you know, you want to try something, spin up a cluster, go bang on it, and then tear it down. Mm -hmm. You know, they'll be able to spin it right back up again. So it's that ability to just, you know, be able to throw it up, mm -hmm. pack away, and then tear it down. And just destroy it at will. And right. just, just get back to where you were in just, like, less than two minutes. I have a full cluster running on my laptop, you know, and I just routinely just blow things away and just run up it again. And I'm back to where I started. Um, and if it fails, you just run it again. It'll fix itself. It's kind of it's kind of amazing. Um, I'm trying to think of something else that we've done with Puppet that was really oh, we also have it deploying our monitoring system. So anytime a new node comes up, we say this is a solar node, and it's monitored. Boom! It exports all of its checks to Isinga, which is uh, Nagios successor. Um, and the next time Nagio, uh, Puppet runs on the monitoring server, it notes all those facts and starts monitoring that machine. We'll show you that at the end. And that, that has been a big win, too, because we're starting to learn more about how the systems are running, what's broken, when is the disk going to be full. We can, we can add mute into that, so we have graphing of a lot of system services. Um, so we're really driving the entire infrastructure now with Puppet, start to finish. So uh, I think next we're going to talk a little bit about Capistrano. Thank you. That's really good. Yeah. Uh, Capistrano, um, it's a remote multi-server automation tool for deploying web applications. Not very commonly used in Java environments, but if, you, if you're if you familiar with Rails, um, that's very common in that community. So when we are evaluating um, automated deployments, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a bunch of uh, open source options out there, but none of them are really as mature as Capistrano. So there is a... a uh, a fork off Capistrano that is a Rails-less version of it. So it kind of takes out all the Rails-isms of it, but gives you the same infrastructure and, and tasking mechanisms. Um, so we uh, headed down that path. We, uh, we use it for uh, scripted deployments, um, which is really important from an operational perspective. Um, not quite as important if you're just, you know, in a sort of Dev sandbox area, but when you're when you're trying to uh, deploy web web applications to multiple uh, customers and maybe different people are doing the deployments, uh, you don't want to be doing these things by hand. You need you need you want to make sure that every operation that was executed on the machine was expected, reviewed, um, in source control. Um, so it gives us that at a minimum, it gives us that ability. Um, it also does binary binary archival for us on those machines, so we have a history of what was actually deployed on that box. Um, there's a slide in a bit that'll kind of show the architecture a little bit uh, better, but um, every time a, a, a new OAE jar basically is deployed, um, it, it gets stored in a releases directory, and then there's a, um, 
a, uh, a system of basically links that shows what's the current, what was the previous for, for rollback, which is the next feature, so you can quickly roll back if a deployment failed um, and not have to tear down the whole machine or do any you know, uh, manual cleanup of it. It'll also, uh, it gives you ability to control uh, clusters asynchronously, so if you want to run one command across a whole bunch of machines, uh, you don't have to go into each one and do it, you can just um, uh, execute any command or task that has you know, a series of commands in it against uh, multiple, multiple machines. So for a cluster, it's really important if we have two plus app servers and I would just want to make, uh, make sure the versions are all consistent, you know, I could just do like cap uh, and then whatever environment, dev, QA, staging, production, whatever, cap, production, version, and it would go and get the version from all those machines and show me what, what's running on there. Um, so, um, and, and, then, and then also it acts as a command dispatch for ops engineering support groups. So, you know, there's, there's routine tasks that support uh, may need to do, whether it's collect logs, um, I don't know, whatever those support people do. What, I don't know. <laughs> that's another <laughs> yeah. session. Yeah, that's all they do. Right? They collect logs. I can't think of <laughs> <laughs> all the operations that they do. Um, we don't want to have, like, you know, I don't know, these, you know, Google Docs or whatever, like, hey, if you need to do this, go do these 10 steps. I just want to create a Capstrano task that, you know, is, is reviewed and, like, okay, what are you actually trying to accomplish? Here's the right way to do it. Okay, now when you need to do it, you're just going to go to, to the Capistrano box, cap, whatever environment, and then your task. Um, uh, that way we, we're not giving SSH access into all these boxes for, uh, not that we wouldn't trust support, but it's easier this way. Um, so here's our build environment um, that kind of sets up how uh, Puppet and Capistrano uh, come into play here. Um, Let's see what to focus on. Um, yeah, so dev uh, checks into GitHub. Our CI runs, uh, uh, Jenkins runs our CI unit test integration tests, um, publishes those results uh, to Sonar. Um, it publishes our, uh, our, our artifacts, binary artifacts into S3. Um, and uh, that's where Capistrano picks up these, these artifacts. So if it wants to deploy the latest version, it's going to grab it from S3. Um, and then it, uh, Capistrano basically is, is the orchestrator of the deployment. So it'll initiate Puppet uh, to get it to known, known state so it doesn't have to do any of those uh, tasks. It, 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 it trusts the machine uh, file system and it, everything's where it expects it to be. Uh, then it goes and deploys uh, the OAE jar to whichever environment. Uh, you asked for. Um, yeah, so that's, that's the environment. Um, so some resources. Um, uh, the full, the normal Rails uh, gem for it is just Capistrano, um, but uh, like I said, we use the Railsless version of it, which is Railsless Deploy, um, so you can install that gem. Um, if you're, if you're uh, using uh, what it calls Capistrano calls multi-stage, which is basically supporting different environments. Um, you would use the capistrano x uh, gem. There's a couple li links for the documentation. Um, it's, it's in Ruby, which is kind of what we've uh, consolidated around for glue code and our tooling. Um, so uh, really easy, clean syntax, and it fits well with, uh, uh, plays well with Puppet, so they get along very nicely. Best buddies. Yeah, definitely. Monitoring. She would say they're best buddies. Yeah, That's right. <laughs> There's no more slides after this one, right? Yeah. I'm going to jump off this slide then. Um, so I'm just going to give you a quick little tour of our monitoring setup. Um, again, powered by Puppet. So let's just get one window. We can see what Lance likes to look at on the internet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Stay on that page a little longer. Uh, oh, wait, hold on. i got to go buy free internet for a second. Um, so, yeah, like I said before, we, we have a new node. We associate a monitoring, I call them targets, and we have a generic monitoring target that will pull up your system information. You know, is SSH running? Uh, is the machine swapping? What's the load? Um, and maybe one other thing. And then we have role-specific targets. So for solar, we're going to deploy some kind of, uh, you'll get to know where I'm staying. Um, 
<laughs> for solar, we monitor. So if you want to go visit her, like, you know, <laughs> full of booze. The place is a mess. Um, I'm sure she'll clean it up. Uh, sorry. <laughs> So yeah, the, the machine kind of registers itself with Puppet, and uh, then the next time we have a Puppet run on the actual monitoring machine, we're going to get some really nice magic. So here's our Icesinga setup. Staging is open to the world, right? There we go. All right. Ignore the critical warning. So we're going to go look at our active services because those are nicer. Go. Do it. So this is really important because like, if you don't know that your systems are healthy, you're out of a job like real quick. And uh, we actually ran into, you know, quite a bit. Our solar servers would fill up their disk. You see right there? Solar disk is critical. So there's almost no free space left, and we need to go. Hypothetically, that would happen, even though it's real. Uh, <laughs> it's staging. We'll blow it up. It's fine. Repuppet it. So you can see we're monitoring specifically the Postgres server. We're, we're jumping into the OAE server and looking at a piece of public content and making sure that we're getting back healthy metadata. So we just we associated one of those ugly content IDs with the, with the uh, Isinga check and make, you know look for some string in the result. And if we don't find it, then we you know, ring the alarms. Uh, we also have a check for an authenticated um, piece of public content, uh, authenticated content, but it's not active right now. We do a, a solar health check where we go in and just query for a single user, make sure that the solar indexing is working and uh, that we can get sane results back. And then eventually we will have warm up times. And uh, this is a really nice piece of functionality. We can essentially monitor any JMX attribute that's ex exported by the system and graph it. So if it's a number, uh, we can jump into Munin here. The only thing I don't like is that these are open source products. They're pretty bare bones. They're not really integrated. Right? It would be really nice to have this kind of overview where you have your health and your graphing and all that stuff. But we're getting there. This is a good first step. Um, and once it loads, you will be really impressed. Uh, man, what is going on here today? Live demos. Hotel Networks. Yeah, I'm about to tether my phone to this thing. No, that didn't help. So we're doing the same thing with the JMX app. There we go. So uh, we can just jump into the solar machine because that's pretty much the most interesting one. And Mutant gives you all this great stuff for free. What's the file system usage? You see it's going up, going up. Uh, inode usage. Oh, you got the reverse scroll on. That's what screwing me up. All these Ethernet, uh, you know, that's not too interesting. Processes and fork rate, that could be interesting. You get nice trending data there. Uh, here we go, solar. Average solar query time. That's going to become important. Uh, the number of documents so we can watch our indexes grow exponentially. This is staging, so it doesn't really change very often. But it is a copy of production data, so we do have quite a few documents. Uh, we can jump into Tomcat. Down at the, where's Tomcat? Here we go. Oh, one more time. It's coming. It's at the bottom. So requests per second. I mean, that's pretty important. And these are things you don't usually get to see on a graph. You're kind of in there guessing, looking at the log, seeing how busy they are. Um, but now we can just associate any JMX attribute at all and throw it on a graph and just watch it over time and get these really nice graphs. So uh, all powered by Puppet, all version controlled, and uh, all publicly available. If you go to my GitHub, eFrozy, you'll find a full working example of a Puppet, puppeted OAE cluster. You'll find all the modules that we've written uh, for OAE. I forked a lot of them and kind of built them, you know, made them a little bit better. I've tried to go upstream, but for some reason, these guys just make puppet modules and they just abandon their GitHub accounts for some reason. I've like open pull requests everywhere. Um, but they're great and they'll save you a hell of a lot of time and headaches. And uh, I think we're ready for questions. Go ahead. Uh, looks like the resource utilization is mainly for capability effect on the server staging. Like, is there a way to look at which the offending documents or users might be causing the IP? Uh, that's more of an application. We haven't gotten that deep. I mean, we're only going to be able to get that. You, you can't monitor every single user and every single piece of content. You're really just checking on the health of the 
aggregate systems. Like, we're going to start drilling deeper, and as we you know encounter more problems and find the solution, yeah, we're going to try to monitor that in the future. But we don't have like really good specific views into like troubling users or classes, things like that. Chris. Uh, that's it. it occurs to me, um, you know the telemetry service that mm -hmm. we have as a 1-3? Yep. It might be useful to have those numbers available on JMX as well. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I'd be surprised if they weren't. The telemetry, I don't know too much about it, but it doesn't expose it as an MB? Uh, no. Yeah. It's, it's like... Uh, no, it's just a circle with uh, some XML. It produces XML. XML. There, there, yeah. but that's, there is a, a reader for not There is a reader for not just. There's uh, so not this Isinga is really just not just plus plus. They they fork the community, but it's completely backwards compatible. So any check that we can find for for Nagios, we can put into the system and uh, you know go to work on it. But there was one. There's a service that was it Resmon was called. Yeah, it's Resmon. That was yeah. like telemetry was designed to work through that. Yeah. But we haven't integrated. I haven't looked too much into that yet. That's the XML produces the, the Resmon format. Resmon format. Yeah. yeah. So. I know there's one for, for Nagios that might be one. The, the hardest part is really figuring out what your thresholds are. You know, like we just don't know yet. We haven't done this for too long yet. Uh, so once we get all the thresholds, then, you know, we'll have sound warnings and, and we'll know what to pay attention to. Uh, also, for all the deployers in the room, uh, if you do start looking at the telemetry numbers um, from running on, uh, uh, we, on the server team, we'd love to hear. Uh, what you're finding the values to be in there. And open a conversation with us and talk to us about uh, the numbers that you see or if you need any other kinds of activities tracked. And where it's really yeah, it's it's time to start learning a lot more about what's going on inside that machine, these these application servers, and you know, hooking up a profiler is great when you're debugging things, but if you really want to see like what happened this week, you know, you you need this kind of system to to show you those trends, and you know you'll you'll find some kind of big sticky point. You're like, what the hell was that? And then you can go start asking real questions. Yeah, so. It's great having these figures, but what do you do when you actually hit thresholds? How do you scale? Um, we at our current scale, we haven't exhausted our resources yet. So we are bound right now, I believe, by the app servers. The solar servers just kind of hum. So it's going to be a lot of work to like, take apart those app servers and using that telemetry service, we'll be able to like probably identify some hotspots. And you know, we either bring it to the community and fix it if it's a problem, or we, you know, whip out the credit card and buy more instances and you know start going wider. So you know, there. If we go back to that first slide or one of Duffy's slides. You know, you can add solar slaves. You can add more app servers. We can just Apache can just. Spray the requests all over the place. So you could, in theory, scale the array through lack of a better word. Yeah, yeah. We could scale yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And as we add those nodes, Puppet will reconfigure the Apache server to add the new line yeah. for the balancer member. So those things are taken care of just by adding in more nodes and oh, making them Puppet aware, We're making Puppet aware of them. So, so you know, one other thing that comes to mind in terms of. Uh, our you know operational abilities around the system is um, we've been able to do rolling upgrades on live systems, which is something new for us. Uh, that was never really possible with the CLE. So you know we've done I don't know maybe a half dozen system upgrades. You know at twelve noon middle of the day. Yeah, just take one um, app server down. Everybody goes this way. All right, everyone's wide. Everybody away. come back. It's really, nice. <laughs> it's really sweet. We haven't had anybody sound the alarm yet. So. Yeah. Could you not do that because you just weren't you weren't set up to do it? I mean, there's there's no reason you couldn't do it. Uh, so CLE, so right? uh, CLE has a lot of session state on the server, right? Um, and unless you get that replicated somehow, which either causes other scalability issues or it's just really hard to do. Right. When you roll over to another CLE app server, you're going to lose your entire state. Also, I was thinking about quiescing servers to the point where you can update. I mean, that rolling sort of rolling restart. Where yeah, you can like a pivot. One drain and yeah. yeah, the problem with CLE is it's almost impossible to quiesce. You might wait like days for the <laughs> server to drain. Also, you, you kind of run into sometimes you have a SQL upgrade that you have to do, and if you have an old version running against you know a new schema, there might be some problems. And with with OAE, there's really no schema, so there's more of software. Uh, 
you know data upgrades that are going along. They they don't right, we can always have two go versions smooth. running at the same time. Right. Yeah. That's it. Thanks for coming. Uh, awesome presentation, guys. This is like pretty much exactly the sort of thing we're going through now. So we're being contacted. Yeah. Um, one of the one of the Nagios checks you had there was checking if it's a public tenant. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering if you had that as a part of your deploy of the OE to add that public content in. Like, how can you be sure that it's public? Content? No, right now it's based on a known piece of content that's out there and it's probably just owned by one of our like support accounts you know it's just some doc I just picked a random one for the for the purposes of the demo um, you could do that you could have a curl command that would just you know upload you know a tiny little text file and then you could just read that text file back out or just read the metadata on it so if it's possible thanks for coming see you around if you have any more questions yeah. Well, it's amazing.